Welcome to the Crazy Hat Chemist. So here we go with a new series here on periodic trends for general chemistry. So let's get moving. Bam! So the original elements. What are the original elements here, folks? And so Aristotle named the four elements. There's a picture of Aristotle. The four elements are fire, air, earth, and water. That's right, folks. You should see the similarities between the symbols that they have there. They are um, very similar and opposite. So fire and um, uh, water are exactly opposites of each other. You should see that. And then air and earth are exactly opposites of each other, right? Fire and water are opposites. Those triangles are um, inverted 180 degrees and air and earth, right? The air is above, the earth is below. They are actually opposites of each other as well. Well, they're really, um, these, these four items here, that's fire, that's not an element at all. Air is actually a mixture, it's not an element. Earth is most certainly not a mixture, uh, uh, excuse me, a air. Earth, let's try that again. Earth is most certainly not an element either. And water is a compound composed of elements. All right, so the Aristotle didn't quite have it correct. So alchemists came up with three more elements, unquote, and, and some of these are most certainly elements here. So quicksilver, which is mercury. And the name quicksilver certainly makes sense. If you look at my periodic table over here, it's right next to gold. That's mercury. It is one of only two elements that are liquid at room temperature and pressure. Can you name the other element that is a liquid at room temperature and pressure? Give it a try. That's right, folks. It's bromine. Bromine is the other liquid at room temperature and pressure. Okay, so quicksilver is mercury. That is most certainly an element. Another one is brimstone, which is sulfur. And I'm, heard, I'm assuming that you've heard of witches and brimstone, but uh, sulfur is the other element that the alchemists came up with. And then there's salt. Salt is most certainly not an element. It's a compound. It's composed of sodium and chlorine, and that's sodium chloride, which is salt. All right, so that's not an element, but it's composed of elements. All right, the, this is an example of an alchemist. Alchemists dominated science, in fact, chemistry for about 2,000 years. And uh, a long story about alchemists, but let's bring it down to a brief story. Um, alchemists do, used to do their chemistry, unquote chemistry, in the background and they wouldn't tell anyone. Why would they not tell anyone? Because if they did tell anyone, then some king or queen would capture them and then um, hold them prisoner until they did the two things that they were trying to do. That is the alchemists were trying to do, they were trying to do one of two tasks. One task was turn base metals into gold. The second task was finding the excelsior of life, which is um, how to live forever. Alchemists were completely unsuccessful in both of those. However, they did come up with lots of other things. Alchemists did hide their information from the kings and the queens and any noblemen or noble women who wanted to find out who they were. And how did they figure that out? How did they hide their information? They wrote down in books lots of glorious pictures and whatnot. So instead of writing down words for their experiments, they wrote down pictures and the colors of the pictures and, you know, like a dragon in white smoke represented something. I don't know what they represented, but they most certainly represented something that's a whole nother area of history. All right, then we come across an actual real scientist who did real chemistry, and he was a Russian scientist, and he is the one that is credited with our modern day periodic table. His name is Dmitry Mendeleev. So don't forget that name, Dmitry Mendeleev. He's a Russian chemist who came up with the modern day periodic table, or the basics of it, okay? So that's a picture of Dmitry Mendeleev. He was, uh, a Russian chemist, really cool, I think. All right, so a little bit more further development about the periodic table. 
and Dmitri Mendeleev specifically. In 1869, Dmitri Mendeleev wrote a textbook and uh, he wrote uh, numerous textbooks in chemistry. And uh, so, um, and that first textbook was in 1869. Cool. And the following year, in 1870, Dmitri Mendeleev published a scientific paper on the periodic table. In fact, his students were the ones to encourage Dmitri Mendeleev to be the one to write, actually, a textbook and publish a paper. Um, because they found it so useful in his classes that he, were te that he was teaching that um, his students said, hey, Dmitri, Dr. Mendeleev, you have to publish this information so that the whole world can know. And it's a good thing that those students did that because the following year, another chemist came up with a similar periodic table. What is that other chemist's name? Everyone doesn't remember because that name gets lost in history. I don't even know. So in 1875, Paul Emile Lecoq uh, discovered gallium. And he reported a density lower than what Dmitri Mendeleev had predicted from his wonderful periodic table. So Dmitri Mendeleev wrote to Paul Emile Lecoq, and he and he suggested to uh, that other scientist, "Hey, you should prepare a more pure sample and retest it." And Lecoq did so, and it did correspond to the information of which Dmitri Mendeleev had suggested originally in his periodic table. That's super cool. This is Dmitri Mendeleev's original periodic table. And if you look very closely, there are lots of missing gaps on his periodic table. So that is key. Okay, um, what is key is that uh, Dmitri Mendeleev predicted values for gallium, um, what was actually discovered. And so that really helped out other scientists. Okay, so the prediction was the atomic mass was 68 grams per mole. This is the molar mass. And what was measured was 69.723 grams per mole. And so that prediction and the discovery coincided. That is amazing. Okay, the density was predicted at six grams per cubic centimeter. And what was measured was 5.91 grams per cubic centimeter. That is also spot on. The melting point was relatively low and compared to other metals, and that's 29.76 degrees Celsius, and that is actually a very low value. That is right above room temperature. In fact, gallium is one of only two or three elements which will actually melt in your hand. Cesium is the other one, which you certainly wouldn't want to try that because that's explosive with air and the sweat in your hand. So I'm not sure what other element does. The oxide formula for gallium is X2O3, meaning that gallium actually has a three plus charge. And that is also uh, referenced here on the periodic table. There's gallium and boron and aluminum both have a three plus charge and gallium also has a three plus charge. Great prediction by Dmitry Mendeleev. Okay, the oxide density is 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter and the measured value was 5.88 grams per cubic centimeter spot on as well. The oxide solubility is that they are both, the oxide is soluble in alkalis. Those are bases and acids. Okay, and that was true. The chloride formula was X2Cl6 and the gallium formula was Ga2Cl6. So that also coincided, the predicted value and the measured value coincided together. Okay. The chloride volatility was that it is very volatile. It goes from the uh, solid state to the gaseous state very rapidly. You should see that all these values here of what Dmitry Mendeleev predicted coincide with what is measured. And that is actually a beautiful thing. There's, that is a perfect thing. So, um, further de development of the per periodic table is that the per Dmitry Mendeleev's periodic table um, had predictive that value. That's a key word, is it, it had predictive value. Since he organized the elements according to their chemical and physical properties and their molar masses, that was key in his design of the periodic table. Prior to that, 
um, other people were designing the periodic table according to like octaves on a period on octaves on a keyboard like a piano completely wrong but his periodic table was based on chemical and physical properties as well as the molar mass of that element awesome idea Dmitry Mendeleev used his newly designed periodic table to modify and correct some of the properties already discovered uh, of elements, and so that was key as well. In addition, he used his periodic table to predict eight elements that were yet undiscovered. Okay, so the first one is gallium, which we already mentioned in 1875, but Paul Emile Lecoq, D, I can't pronounce that. Hopefully you can. The second one is scandium in 1875, 1879 by Lars Frederick Nelson. Germanium in 1886 by Clemens Wilker, Winkler. Polonium in 1898 by Marie and Pierre Curie. And of course, you know who uh, Marie Curie is. That's Madame Curie. All right. And then protect in 1900 by William Crookes and Rhenium in 1825 by Walter Nodick and Ida uh, Tacky um, and Tectinium in 1837 by Carlo Pierre and Emilio Segre. I'm pronouncing these names incorrectly, I apologize. And finally, Francium in 1839 by Margaret Perry. Isn't that amazing? He predicted, that is Dmitry Mendeleev predicted, eight elements that were yet undiscovered, and he helped these scientists fine-tune their discovery. So from his periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev's periodic table, he had gaps for where gallium was, for where scandium was, for where tectinium was. And based on those gaps, other scientists were able to come up with um, based on the periodic table, because it had predictive value, because the per periodic table is organized according to chemical and physical properties, scientists were able to look for specific properties. And from those specific properties, they were able to discover new elements. Super cool. All right, so they really are on the shoulder of a giant, and that is Dmitry Mendeleev. Dmitry Mendeleev discovered and devised the periodic law what is the periodic law? The periodic law states the following. As elements increase in atomic mass uh, or atomic number, as we later on discover, the elements have reoccurring or, quote, periodic chemical and physical properties. That is the periodic law. You should know the periodic law. It's extremely important. Here's Dmitry Mendeleev's periodic table, and as I fore mentioned, um, our modern periodic table in the back, you should see Dmitry Mendeleev's uh, periodic table of which he designed and it's kind of like a deck of cards imagine a deck of cards so if you have four suits and you have the ace uh, king queen jack uh, 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 then you should be able to if someone were to pick one random card out you should be able to spread out the cards put them in suit and in order within that suit and you should be able to figure out what card they're missing. It's pretty much the same thing that Dmitry Mendeleev did. He took all the elements with their known chemical and physical properties, put them on cards, reordered them, and then he figured out where the missing spots were on the periodic table after his design of the periodic table. Again, the periodic table that he designed had predictive value, so that is really truly key. Okay, so here's scandium and here's gallium, and here's uh, germanium, three of the elements of which he predicted that were yet undiscovered. So we're gonna move on to another thing here, and moving on, we have some characteristics of metals. So first of all, we gotta figure out where the metals are and where the non-metals are, okay? So you, do you see that orange staircase line there? Everything to the right of that orange staircase line is a non-metal. Everything to the left of that orange staircase line is a metal excluding one element. So to the left of this orange staircase line are the metals excluding what element? That's hydrogen. Hydrogen is most certainly a non-metal. So what are the characteristics of metals? 
Number one, they are solid at room temperature and room pressure. And mercury is the only exception. Mercury, as I aforementioned in this lecture here, is a liquid at room temperature and pressure. Okay, metals have high luster, i.e. they are shiny. They can be polished. If you take steel wool or sandpaper or grind them or rub them, you should see that metals are shiny. Look at a piece of gold, a piece of silver, a piece of copper that's been polished. It's most certainly shiny. Got it. Metals are good conductors of heat. That is, they are cold in the winter time when it's cold outside, and they are hot in the summertime when it's hot outside. And they transfer that energy, so they are good conductors of heat and energy. So, for example, if you were to cut, touch the uh, car hood, a hood of a car um, that's made out of metal, um, even if I've even if no one has driven it for a long time, in the winter time, then that hood of that car will be very cold. In the summertime, it will be very, very hot because metals conduct heat. Metals are also good conductors of electricity and you should be aware of this. Wherever you live, the wires in the walls of your um, house, your apartment, your dwelling, whatever it is, is more than likely copper. If it's not copper, it's uh, bundles of um, aluminum, if nothing else, okay? Uh, by the way, the best conductor of electricity is not copper, it is silver, but it tarnishes rather easily and then it's not as good a conductor. All right, metals are also malleable, that means that they can be rolled or hammered into sheets. Think about aluminum foil, you have this to wrap your turkey up if you celebrate Thanksgiving with a big fat turkey, or maybe you have some pizza and you want to warm it up, or maybe you get, you know, some... Uh, something at the end of a meal at a restaurant and you want to take some leftovers home, it's wrapped up in aluminum foil. It's not tin foil. Don't make that mistake. So they're malleable. Metals are malleable. They um, are rolled or hammered into sheets. Look at aluminum foil. Metals are also ductile. They can be drawn into wires. Again, think about that copper wire that's inside your, um, the walls of your dwelling, your house, your apartment. Another way is if you have a ring that is truly um, a metal that's been drawn into a wire and then bend around itself and, and, and fuse together. Or if you have a necklace, that's just a bunch of wires. That's all that is. Metals have high melting points. Um, that's why most of them are solid at room temperature and pressure except for mercury. And metals have high densities. Um, that means that most of them are solids at room temperature and pressure as well. So these are the characteristics of metals. Please note them. Okay. All right. So here's some examples of metals that I have in my classroom. I have some group one metals here. They are in oil. That's why uh, they're not uh, associated with water because otherwise that would have a very violent reaction. Well, I have some of those reactions on my YouTube channel. Here are some other metals. And here are some further other metals, okay? So metals are all over the place. The vast majority of the elements on the periodic table are metals. There are very few that are not. It's a very small portion of the periodic table which have non-metals. Now, the characteristics of non-metals. Where are the non-metals? So the non-metals are to the right of that orange staircase line, including hydrogen. So the non-metals are to the right of that orange staircase line, including hydrogen. What are the characteristics of non-metals? Well, there's exactly opposite of the metals, so it makes it really nice and simple. So, if metals have high melting points, then non-metals have low melting points. If metals are good conductors of electricity and heat, then non-metals are poor conductors of electricity and heat. That pretty much summarizes it up. Just look at the opposite of each one of the metal characteristics to get the non-metal characteristics. They are solids, liquids, and gases, and yes, that is true. There are non-metals that are solids, liquids, and gases, and that doesn't hold true for the metals. All right, good. So here are some non-metals that I have in my classroom, um, a whole bunch of them, and one of the very unique non-metals is sulfur. It is yellow. Yellow is a very unusual color for any element, and um, that is super cool. It actually has a pungent odor to it, if you're unaware of that. And the really cool thing about sulfur is that when you burn it, it burns blue. That is also really cool.
okay? Not too many things that you burn, you get a blue flame color to them. Check that out, okay? Then we have another category here on the periodic table. So the black and the white, or the yin and the yang, or the heads and the tails are metals and non-metals. However, there's a whole nother category here that, that fits in between. So if you imagine yourself, you have a piece of property and your neighbor has a piece of property right adjacent to yours. So what is the dividing line? Whose property is that? Is that your property or your fence's prop or your, uh, or your neighbor's property where the fence is? So it's the dividing line between the two properties. That dividing line are in, on the periodic table are called the metalloids or the semi-metals. So the metalloids are the semi-metals what kind of characteristics do they have and which ones are they okay so these are the metalloids or the semi-metals we acknowledge generally that there are seven of them okay and so if we look at our orange staircase line which is not on this periodic table but you can imagine that it's separating the gray from the green over here okay and so it's one skipping aluminum because that's a metal two three four five six and either six or one of these is seven so we the metalloids have not a set of characteristics right their properties are shared between metals and non-metals they don't have a precise set of defined characteristics that's what makes them metalloids right it's not heads it's not tails it's not black it's not white it's gray it's on the fence so for example, silicone is a metalloid. It is, it conducts electricity. So that is a metal characteristic, okay? It's a solid, it's a metal characteristic. However, um, it is not malleable and not ductile. Um, and that is, it crushes when you try to do any of those things. That is, you draw it into wires or roll it or pound it into sheets and that is a non-metal characteristic. So each of the non-metals has their own unique set of characteristics, so there's not one set of characteristics that we can write down. They're kind of like in between, just kind of like on the fence or on the side of the coin if you have heads and tails. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the representative or the main group elements, okay? And I'm gonna give a quick little demonstration, so I'm gonna step out here for just a moment. I'm gonna come right back after I get my periodic table. So I apologize for that just a moment here. What are the main group or the representative elements? Well, um, what are they? They are right here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fold a periodic table. So you should see there on your screen, you have the S and P type orbitals. So there's a periodic table. This is the one that I use for my general chemistry class. All right, perfect. All right, so what grade do you not wanna get in chemistry? You don't wanna get an F. So if you looked at my previous videos, you should see that there's an F block of elements. We're going to fold those out. So what I've done is I've taken the periodic table and I have folded out the S. What other grade do you not want to get in a chemistry class? That would be a D. So you want to get rid of the Ds as well. This is a real easy way to uh, decrease the number of students in your class potentially. Um, or if you're not studying, then you're getting the D and the F. So there are the Ds. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our hand right here, scoop it out here underneath here of the periodic table, and we're gonna combine the remaining groups together. That is S and P, that is satisfactory passing grades. Those are the representative or main group elements. So they represent all the elements, their main group elements. So just think about the House of Representatives and how that represents you as a populace. That is the same thing that is supposed to be occurring here. There's metals, there's non-metals, there's metalloids. There's all the basic types of chemistry within the main group elements. That's why they're called the main group or the representative elements. So make sure you know those. Again, what you're doing is you're folding out the Fs, you're folding out the Ds and combining what remains and that is S and P type orbitals which are satisfactory passing grades in chemistry. Perfect. Hopefully you got that, and don't forget that. 
Let's continue on with a just a summary of some of the periodic trends that we're going to be discussing in this unit here. Okay, so electron affinity. So electron affinity is liking electrons. I'm going to go into more detail about each one of these a little bit more here, but the first one is liking electrons, electron affinity. And that is increasing as you go up and to the right. All right. Our next trend is electronegativity. That is within a bond, you um, grab and pull the electrons to you if you are very electronegative. Where do they increase in electronegativity? Up and to the right. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. The next one is ionization energy. That's removal of an electron from the gaseous state. And that also follows the same trend. That is up and to the right. Electronegativity is high in this right-hand corner. That means electron affinity is high in this corner, electronegativity is high in this corner, and ionization energy is high in this corner. And exactly the opposite. If you look in this lower corner over here, in the lower corner, in way down here off of my periodic table, you will find that that is very low. Atomic size. Where is atomic size in relationship to the three aforementioned ones? It's exactly opposite. So that is going to be increasing in atomic size as you go down and to the left on the periodic table. Okay, and that's just a quick little summary of our trends. We're gonna talk about each one here. All right, so the first one is atomic size, which is atomic radius. So atomic radius is half the distance between two bonded nuclei, atoms nuclei. And here's a cute little picture here. We got two atoms. We got the dots representing the nuclei. And half that distance is going to be the atomic radius. On this chart here, I have in picometers, that is times 10 to the negative 12. That's really tiny, by the way. I have in picometers the distances um, uh, or the atomic radii of certain elements. And you should see, if you look at group one, starting with hydrogen at the top, we have uh, 37, then 152, 186, 227, 248, and 265. That's increasing as you go down. So the atomic radii increases as you go down the group. Okay, and then as you go to the right within a period, starting with potassium and calcium and scandium, titanium, vanadium, and chromium, all the way to bromine and krypton, you should see that they decrease going to the right. Okay, so the trend in size, atomic size, atomic radii, is going to be de uh, sorry, increasing in size as you go down a group. And it will be decreasing in size as you go to the right. And so I'm gonna flip that arrow the other way and that will show me that it's an increasing in size going to the left. Okay, so the overall net is increasing in size as you go down and to the left on the periodic table. That's what we have for atomic or atomic size or atomic radius. And the ion sizes follow this same trend here. All right. So why is the atomic radii increasing going down a group? So as the principal quantum number, that is n, increases, that is the number to the left-hand side on the periodic table, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. As this increases, the new, the new outer energy uh, shell is used. That's called a shell. The n values are the shells. The electrons in this outer level are held less tightly by the positive proton charge because the nucleus is being shielded by other shells that are on interior electrons. That increases the distance of those outermost electrons, and that increases the size, the atomic radius, the atomic size of the atom or the ion as you move down a group. So the nucleus is represented by that Z. Remember the AXZ, the A is the atomic mass, the uh, X is the symbol of that element, and Z is the number of proton, protons, which is the number, the atomic number. Okay, and there is a, um, the electrons and the protons are attracted to each other. The electrons move closer in, the protons are in the nucleus. But these are attractive forces. Then there are these forces, which are electron-electron repulsive forces. So this is just like if you were to look at the same side of a magnet, that's the negative end and the negative end, they repulse each other. Or the positive end and the positive end, they repulse each other. And that's why it moves and gets larger. So why atomic radii increases going down a group? So another analogy here is that the king and the queen, they're positive. 
The nobles are outside of them. They are shielding. The knights are being shielded as well by the nobles and the peasants and the serfs. That's all the rest of us here. They are being similarly shielded. So as you go farther away, um, then you get larger in size because you're being shielded by all the previous shells of negative charge that increases the size of that atom. So why does the atomic radii decrease across a period with increasing Z? So um, as one moves across a period to the right, an electron is added to the outer principal energy level. This corresponds to an increase in the nuclear charge because you're adding a proton as well with the addition of a proton. This pulls the electrons more tightly around the nucleus. This attraction, uh, this attraction more than balances the repulsive forces of the added electrons to that prior uh, shell. That reduces that no radius. So as you move across the periodic table to the right, you're adding a proton, you're adding a proton, and you're adding an electron, you're adding an electron. But that proton is greater in charge, if you will. It's drawing those electrons in tighter. The decrease in size across the period is a result of the increase in what's called the effective nuclear charge. And that is the effective nuclear charge. That's the number of protons which draws the electron clouds closer to it. This is within the same period. Okay, and here's a little bit of math on determining the effective nuclear charge. The Z effective nuclear charge is the Z, that's the atomic number, minus the inner shell electrons. Okay, so a graphic of the atomic radius and the atomic number. This is a great one. So it's um, atomic radius is on the y-axis, this is in picometers, and the atomic number is on the x-axis. Okay, so atomic number is one, two, three, four, five, and uh, etc. Okay, and you should see that I have labeled there lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. And as you see that as you go down a group, as you go down a group, they get bigger. That makes sense. So why are rubidium and cesium not on the line? So you should see that rubidium and cesium are not on the line, and you need to think about this ladder. And that is, as you get further from the nucleus, then the rungs to the ladder are not all equal distant. And so um, that is why this occurs. So the biggest jump is from n of one up to n of two, and then n of two to n of three is a smaller jump, and n of three to n of four is even a smaller jump. So as you get farther and farther away from the nucleus, then those rungs, those shells, are not nearly in equal distance away, okay? So reasons behind cation size. So this is very important. We have cations, we have anions. Um, I saw this great license plate the other day, and I used to always use this. I tried to take a picture of it, but I was unable to. But um, the summary of it is, is that cations, how do you remember cations? Well, cations are similar to cats, and cats have paws. And that is, paws are positive. So cations are positive, just like the positive pole of a battery. You have a car battery, you have a nine volt battery. Look at it, it's the red end of the battery. It's the positive end because cations have positive pause. Just a thought. Okay, so the electron configuration for sodium is um, neon core and 3s1. It has one valence electron. Sodium is going to lose that one valence electron becoming a sodium ion. That is a cation. The sodium ion is a cation because it's positively charged, okay? Sodium ion has the electron configuration of neon because that 3s1 electron has been removed, but it still has the same number of protons. So it has not changed in terms of an element because the number of protons dictates which element it is. The size of the sodium ion, that is the cation of sodium, is smaller than that of the uh, atom itself or the element itself because of two reasons. Number one, you have lost that outer valence electron. That reduces the electron-electron um, repulsions in addition. Furthermore, the effective nuclear charge has increased, right? You just lost an electron, now you have 
10 electrons instead of 11. And so those 10 uh, electrons are being held less tightly to the 11 protons that have not changed, okay? So the end result here, and this is just one example, so any metal follows this same category uh, as a generalization, and metals lose electrons and they form cations. The cations are always smaller than the atoms or the metals from which they come. Note that on the very bottom. Cations are always smaller than the atoms from which they come. Why is that? They lost their outer valence electron or electrons. Their electron-electron repulsion has um, decreased and their effective nuclear charge, that is the number of protons uh, to electrons, that ratio has increased. The effective nuclear charge has increased. Okay, that's the reason behind cation size. So ions of metals, which are cations, are always smaller than the atoms from which they come. Cool. So here's just a little pictorial diagram for you. That's the sodium atom. Here's a sodium ion. You should see that the ion is smaller than the atom. That's the same for every single metal because they lose electrons. All right. Now. The opposite of this, because these are going to be non-metals, non-metals gain electrons and they form what are called anions. So if you look at the pole on a battery, there's a positive end, that's the cation. There's the negative end, that's the anions. It's, called, it's actually called the cathode and the anode of a battery. That's what it's called, okay? But those root words are right here in the cation and the anion, the cathode and the anode for a battery. battery. Those root words are right here. So the electron for configuration for the chlorine atom is as follows. It's a neon core, 3s2, 3p5. And what does chlorine do? Well, it's going to gain an electron because it's a non-metal. So it gains a 3p electron that forms a chloride ion. So that chloride ion's electron configuration is going to be neon 3s2, 3p6. That is the electron configuration for argon. So it, the number of protons has not changed because it is still chlorine, but it is now an ion of chlorine because it has gained an electron instead of losing an electron. So, so the atom is smaller than the ion for nonmetals. That is the chloride ion is larger than the atom. Why is this? Well, it's gained an electron in the outermost electron shell, and that increases that electron-electron repulsion. Electrons are the same charge, so it's in an increase that electron-electron repulsion, pushing those electrons out further. Furthermore, um, and that's shown in this diagram here with all the red ones. The effective nuclear charge has decreased. That is, there are fewer protons relationship to the number of electrons on the, in the total ion itself. There's actually, for chloride ion, there's one more electron that would be, um, so chlorine is element number 17. It would have 18 electrons as opposed to 17 electrons. It still has 17 protons. So the number of protons hasn't changed, but the number of electrons has increased. So what do you need to know as a general rule of thumb is the following. That is, anions are always larger than the atoms or the nonmetals from which they come. Notice that this is exactly opposite that of metals. Right, we already covered metals, which lose electrons and get smaller. Non-metals gain electrons and get larger. So that's why the anions, the things that have gained electrons, which are non-metals, are going to be larger than the atoms from which they come. That's gonna be holding true for every single case. I've given you an example of a cation metal as sodium and a non-metal as chlorine and any metal will lose electron and any non-metal will gain electrons. And the same thing will hold true for the cations are always smaller than the atoms from which they come and the anions are always larger than the atoms from which they come. Here's a little pictorial diagram. This is the chlor chloride 
uh, uh, chlorine atom here, and this is the ion. So the ion is going to be larger than the atom, okay? All right, here's just a little quick summary of all this. Metal atoms are always larger than their counter metal ions. And you should see this, that the um, atoms are all in gray on this. And then you have metals and metal ions. Those metal ions are in red. So there's a metal atom in gray, metal ion in red. So the exact opposite is going to occur with the non-metals. So the non-metals, those atoms are always smaller than their counter non-metal ions. So um, the ion itself is colored in blue and the atom is colored in gray. So on both of these, the atom is gray, but the ion is a color either red or blue. You should see that the, if it's a metal, and it loses an electron or multiple electrons, the ion is always smaller. That ion is called a cation. For a non-metal, their atom is gray and the ion is blue. And so all of those non-metals are going to gain electrons and they're going to get bigger. The reason that the metals lose electrons and get smaller, the cations are smaller because there are, um, they've lost a shell They've gotten, so they've lost that outer electron, they've lost that shell, they've gotten smaller, and their effective nuclear charge has increased. Whereas the non-metals on the other side, the non-metals, they have gained an electron, so their electron-electron repulsion has increased, and their effective nuclear charge has decreased. Those are the summary of those reasons. All right, here's a nice graphic that shows this atom and ion trend size. So you should see that as you go down a group, as you go to the left, the size of either an atom or an ion increases. So as you go down any group, down a group, down a group, down a group, they're getting larger, okay? As you go to the right, they're getting smaller. So consequently, if you turn that around, as you go to the left, they're getting um, larger. Yeah, perfect. So trend in atom or ion size is as you go down a group, they get bigger. As you go to the left, they get bigger. You got that. All right, next topic, ionization energies, okay? We're gonna cover that in the next video. I'll see you then. So um, if you're liking what you're seeing here, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Greatly appreciate that. Ionization energy and more is gonna be coming in our next video that we're gonna tie into this first one. I hope you have a great afternoon, great morning, great day, whatever it works for you. See you then. Bye for now.